Okay, so we're going to talk about trap cards today in Yu-Gi-Oh! This one's always a nice discussion topic because everyone sort of likes to say that trap cards are dead in Yu-Gi-Oh! I think that's not really accurate. I mean, trap cards are definitely still played today. They're not the same trap cards that you would have seen 5, 10, or even 15 years ago, but they still exist. But still, though, we need to kind of have, I guess, a conversation around the history of trap cards, their role in the game, how it sort of shifted, and then at the end I want to hear what people, what you guys like think about trap cards. Like, you know, are you happy with where they are in the game? What sort of changes to design would you like to see? All right, so early on trap cards, I say early on, I'm when I say that I mean like 2002 to say like 2010, because I think the trap cards didn't drastically change during that period of time. Trap cards were basically things that could stop a monster from attacking or stop a monster from, like, being on the field. So, a lot of the old classics that come to mind are Mirror Force and Torrential Tribute. Those are kind of the strong board wipes. There were, of course, a few other ones. Things like Malevolent Catastrophe and Widespread Ruin were somewhat more, like, you know, niche ones, but they did similar things. Needle Sealing. Um... Then there's just the stuff that can sort of stop a monster on summon. I think of Trap Hole, I think of Bottomless Trap Hole. Um, I feel like Sakuretsu Armor and Dimensional Prison probably belong in this conversation. And of course we can't forget about things like the Solemn cards. At the time it was really mostly just Solemn Judgment, but over time we've gotten you know Solemn Warning, Solemn Strike. And even before then we have had cards like Divine Wrath or Seven Tools of the Bandit, which were, oh, Dark Bribe as well, Counter Traps that sort of just, you know, negate things. Um, those traps were all interesting to me. I liked those trap cards because basically there was sort of a, um, a give and take to trap cards. They were relevant in that they were very powerful. You obviously didn't want to lose your board to an untimely Turtle Tribute. You wanted to play around Mirror Force. You know, you didn't want your monster to get bottomless. But, uh, the, the, the give and take was that, like, trap cards had to be set first. And today, that's just seen as, like, okay, that's why you don't want to play traps. You have to set them and then use them. That makes them slow. But really, what was more interesting to me back then was that setting a trap card meant that it was now on the field, and so it was therefore telegraphed. Now, if your opponent can see that you have, say, two cards set, the ideas sort of start running in your head, right? Like, okay, what are these set cards? What are the common threats they could be? It might be an MST or some other spell, but maybe it's more likely that it's a trap. Okay, what trap? So you normal summon a monster with maybe over 1500 attack, and it doesn't get bottomless trap hold or trap hold or anything like that. So it stands to reason that, okay, maybe those cards aren't, you know, a bottomless. Maybe it's not a bottomless trap hole. Could be still, but you know, you kind of get to reason it out. Then you attack with your monster, and it doesn't get hit by like a D prison or anything, or mirror force. So maybe you can kind of rule those out. So maybe it's like a Torrential Tribute that's lying in wait. Maybe it's a Mirror Force, but they're waiting on more cards to get summoned. Maybe it's a Bombless, but they didn't think that your monster, you know, had, like, was enough of a threat. Maybe it's something else entirely. And to me, I liked that sort of, like, mental tug of war where you could sort of eliminate options in your head. As the game went on, the nature of what cards could be set, it kind of varied a bit, you know? Like, if your opponents use, say three or four traps throughout the game, you kind of look in their grave and like, okay, Torrential Tribute's gone, and the Mirror Force is gone, and the bomb, like, you can kind of maybe reason what the remaining traps are based on what's been used. And then that got even more interesting as, like, you went into games two and three if you're playing a full match, because, like, you kind of have a better idea of what their traps are, so now you can kind of think about it more. And there's a whole conversation to be had, really, about how hand traps aren't as, like, fun or interesting to me for that reason because I feel like they just come out of nowhere so it's harder to like telegraph them. I like that trap cards kind of put the onus on your opponent to consider them but like they still gave the opponent the power to play around them or even deal with them with like an MST or something. And of course you can set as many traps as you wanted because for a long time Heavy Storm was legal. So that's kind of the role of older trap cards. There's, well, I don't want to leave out too much. I will say that older trap cards tended to be like kind of one for one card exchanges. That's an important thing to note. So basically, like a bombless trap hole is a one for one exchange. Even a solemn judgment in many cases is like a one for one exchange. Same with D Prison. 
the stronger things like Mirror Force or Eternal Tribute could of course be like more of a swing in your favor if you timed them right but you know like your opponent's obviously going to make sure to try not to let you do that so i liked that whole dynamic of trap cards and traps were also seen as something that were like you played a good amount of them in your deck you would play trap cards in almost any deck like nowadays if you're playing a combo deck it's pretty common to see no trap cards at all or very 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 few but um if you're playing like a trap deck i guess sure you might be running like 20 but there's not as much of an in-between, I suppose, and I like that, you know, in older Yu-Gi-Oh, here comes the boomer in me, it's, look, just deal with me for a bit, all right? In older Yu-Gi-Oh, any deck just would play eight or ten traps. It was just kind of the norm. Over time, I think we saw trap cards get a little bit more powerful. That's kind of where the Solemn Strikes come in. I think that's actually even where Venus Chain, to some degree, draws some, like, relevance here. Um, and we'll fast forward to today. Today, I think trap cards are, it's not that they aren't played, but a lot of the most popular trap cards are cards that can be activated from your hand. It's gotta be noted. Infinite impermanence can be set and used like a normal trap, and it even has a benefit to doing so when it locks out the column, but evenly matched is really, you know, it's hard to say that it's even a trap card at all. It, pretty rarely gets set and used in that way. It's oftentimes just sort of dropped as a hand trap when you go second, and it can be extremely powerful and like, you know, wipe a board away, but is it a trap card really? Uh, I don't really know. And then there's like floodgates, that's something. It's interesting because floodgates have been around pretty much since Yu-Gi-Oh's inception, and they kind of come in and out of the metagame. Rivalry of Morlords and Goats and Match have been around for like ages and ages and ages. Macrocosmos was one of the really oppressive ones and it finally got put to one. Same with Skill Drain. Um, right now, I think that Floodgates, and I say right now, I mean like we're talking kind of last one, two, three years of Yu-Gi-Oh, modern Yu-Gi-Oh, we'll say. Floodgates have kind of taken on the role as like the super oppressors. So while they were always annoying before, because the game was a little bit slower paced and people maybe ran more cards like MST at the time, dealing with floodgates felt a little bit more manageable. These days though, I feel like because so many decks are kind of just putting their foot hard on the gas on the first or second turn and they summon everything they can, it coincidentally makes cards like Summon Limit, cards like There Can Be Only One, goes in rivalry, even stuff like Imperial Order, like increasingly stronger as a result because so much is like riding on these like one card combos. And just, so I don't know. Um, I, I think that with trap cards, they're probably never going to be able to get back to a place exactly where they've been in the past. We've seen some return, like, you know, I know um, Needle Ceiling and Turtle Tribute have kind of made comebacks today. We've seen trap-based decks see a lot of success. Altergeist, Eldlich, Subterror, Guru Control, I suppose, that's kind of a, a trap deck. Um, they've all seen play, but I don't know exactly where the appropriate power level and, like, use cases for traps lie. Like, for instance, I think most people don't see traps as specifically threatening enough to ever really run, like, go so far as to run, like, say, a Seven Tools of the Bandit or Wiretap. I remember periods of time where cards like that were staples, especially Wiretap when it first came out. That's not really the case anymore, so no one really wants to run something that specifically stops traps. Um, also, trap cards, I guess, nowadays are facing a lot of, like, heavy opposition. You've got Harpy's Feather Duster, which is at one, and that can nuke your board, but now there's also like Lightning Storm and Evenly Matched, which is ironically, you know, Trap Card or whatever, that can just wipe a board clean. So running traps is harder nowadays. Um, you still have to contend with the idea that like going second when you're playing a trap deck puts you pretty far behind your opponent. I don't really know uh, if it's a good place for traps, but... Maybe if you'd asked me the question like a few years ago, I might have said trap cards just seem like they have no place in the game. Like we're talking maybe 2018 or so. Uh, these days I think that they've found a pretty healthy balance, but it really just depends on who you ask. Some people might want like more of the one for one removal style trap cards to make a return. But I think that my, my overall thesis now with trap cards is 
they have to be making a boom in order to be played. The idea of just using a single dimensional prison on like one monster or a bomb with strap hole or a fiendish chain generally just isn't worth it. Even if those cards can be useful, it seems like you've really kind of got to go all in with your traps. It's got to be an evenly matched. It's got to be a torrential tribute. It's got to be something like a floodgate that just completely kind of spins the game in your favor. I'd still say that's kind of what a trap card should be. You know, it's a trap that your opponent walks into. They can walk into a torrential tribute. I guess you could say they can walk into an evenly matched or something like that. Uh, floodgates, well, you know, decide for yourself. But yeah, so I'm pretty happy with where trap cards are. Um, it's not a bad place, but I'm very curious. What do you guys think? Do you guys feel like trap cards are, you know, still a integral part of Yu-Gi-Oh? Are you happy with the role that they've taken on these days? I'm, like I said, you know, I've kind of come to terms with it. I didn't like it so much at first, but even just talking about it within this video has made me sort of think, eh, traps are all right. And maybe their place is fine. They've grown with the game just like every other card and strategy has. So whether or not you consider that to be fair, maybe you think that they need a boost or something like that, I don't know. But I want to hear it down in the comments. So yeah, let's hear it. Let me know what you guys think. I'll see you in the next one. Fast turn.